First, we have Dr. Eski Britton, a renowned author, surfer, and marine social scientist. She specializes in ocean and human health and our interdependencies between them. Her combined expertise as both a professional surfing ambassador and researcher have extended beyond academia into including facilitation for Blue Space Six experiences in the Middle East and also contributing to developing the international best practice framework for adaptive surfing. Joining her will be Dr. Jamie Marshall, a research fellow from Edinburgh Napier University, who specializes in community-based approaches to supporting positive mental health. He started his professional career by founding the WAVE project in Scotland, which is a slightly bigger version of liquid therapy. And, uh, but we welcome him equally. Um, building on his in-field experience, Jamie undertook the world's first PhD, explicitly exploring the mechanisms underlying surf therapy. So bringing together for the first time ever on stage, please welcome Dr. Eski Britton and Dr. Jamie Marshall. Yeah, such an honor to be here. So Jamie and I have crossed paths through our shared passion, uh, researching uh, our human relationship with the ocean, its impact on our health and well-being um, in the context of surf therapy, especially. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, yeah, we've known each other for years, but this is literally the first time we've joined in person. And today we just wanted to share a little bit about who we are, the passion that drives our work, and then uh, our involvement with liquid therapy and the work they're doing, especially the really beautiful program, Adito, A Drop in the Ocean. Uh, we're going to share some very initial preliminary findings on that. So that's really exciting. The first time anyone is going to see it. <laughs> but they are preliminary. So data is still coming in. Um, and then also, what what do we mean when we talk about blue health? And for us, what do we see as the sort of the heart of it, the core of it, uh, in terms of the impact it has in the context of mental health and the ways that that's supported and facilitated by the work of something uh, of, of an organization like Liquid Therapy? Mm -hmm. I think a, a good place to start, because I know we're all starting at slightly different places, maybe, is actually talking about what do we mean by surf therapy? It's a word we're going to use quite a lot in the next 45 minutes, but what do we actually mean by that? Eski threw this at me about 30 seconds ago, and as a board member of the International Surf Therapy Organization, I should be able to recite our definition word for word. I still can't. Um, but essentially, surf therapy is the use of surfing as a vehicle to achieve therapeutic outcomes to improve mental, physical, or sort of social well-being. Um, I think that's fairly close to it. The key part of that is surfing is the vehicle. Um, surf therapy is so much more than just going surfing. I noticed one of the boxes up here talks about what happens between the waves. That's exactly it. Um, you know, going surfing is good for you. Phys we know physical activity is good for your mental health. That's a fact. There is no dispute in the literature anymore about that. So going surfing is good for you. Um, but it needs these additional structures, these additional elements before we can call it surf therapy. And we need to focus on those to better understand what we can um, as we were talking about just there, about things we can take to new places, things we can adapt to different contexts. We're very lucky. You guys are very lucky for this wonderful beach and wonderful, the, uh, the Wild Atlantic Way, just incredible space. Not everyone has access to the ocean. So what can we learn from those structures that are so important that can translate to different contexts and different activities? Yeah. Okay, so I think we're, we have a few slides. Uh, hopefully not too data heavy. But <laughs> Yeah, essentially looking at connections, how the ocean, um, how our connection with the ocean can facilitate a deeper connection socially, uh, with our own sense of self and our bodies with each other, and then with the, the natural world we live in. Uh, okay, so there's a little bit about me, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, we each chose an image we, we thought would share to, to capture our own ocean connection before we start talking about it in a broader context. So this is from just over a year ago and I'm in the bay here. Um, I'm seven months pregnant with twins. <laughs> but what I feel for me it really captures in terms of my ocean connection, this is really what I have uh, got from it is this real sense of, of belonging. It's my place of belonging. Um, and it's the source of all life and it's how all life began. Um, how each of us began in, in the water of the womb before we came out into the world. Uh, and in a way, I think that that's why there's 
something to that, why our return to the ocean, when we seek it, uh, seek it out for our own healing, why it can be so potent. And that's definitely reflected in the response at times of uh, collective crisis. I really saw that during the pandemic and since people being drawn to the water more and more, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, so that's where it comes to me. It's a lifelong passion. I grew up here and learned to surf on this beach, stood on a surfboard from the age of four. Um, and it's something that's been passed on intergenerationally in our family. And what drives my work is always wanting to better understand uh, that relationship we have with the ocean and how do we restore some of those lost connections uh, with water, with the natural world, with the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, and seeing the, as we'll talk about now, the interconnection between our health and well-being and, and the health of the ocean itself um, and how integral all of that is. Um, so I think that's all I'll, I'll say there. Yeah. Yeah. And this is me. <laughs> uh, I, um, my connection with the water goes intergenerational as well. My grandfather taught me to swim before I could walk. Actually, I got married two weeks ago, and this is his wedding ring that I'm now wearing. And actually, quite emotionally, last week, I took it surfing for the first time. And, you know, I lost him quite a long time ago. But if he knew what my career and, you know, how much time I spend in the water now, it would just make him so happy. Um, but he introduced me to the water, and when I was at school, I had a fairly rough time with bullying and things, and the water was my escape. Um, fresh water, salt water. I actually, before I was a surfer, I was a whitewater kayaker. Um, I used to play in weirs on the Thames, because I actually grew up down near England. Um, and then I found surfing, and sort of one thing led to another, and here we are today. Um, but I chose this picture because it is just... This, this is a... For any... Um, this is something I learned the Wave Project. A great way, as soon as you've got um, someone who's a little bit nervous about the water, if you stick seaweed down your wetsuit, suddenly they seem to be less nervous about it. Because <laughs> they're thinking, at least I don't look like this guy. Um, <laughs> but what I love about this photo is um, it was a, just a snapshot that um, the current Scotland coordinator of the Wave Project took back when I was, I was visiting and I just decided to help out at a session. And there's just like, it's, I'm just happy. Like, it's one of those photos where there's sheer joy. Um, you know, I tried to find a really cool photo of me surfing, but my surfing face doesn't give that. It's a pretty <laughs> weird one. But yeah, I mean, just it sums up, you know, the water. I'm terrible at it. I write about this all the time, and I don't get myself in the water as much as I should. Because um, this is what I look like when I come out. And I need to look like this more often. Um, but yeah, so that's my, my connection. I think it's fascinating, given some stuff we're going to talk about, how we both have that intergenerational connection already. Um, but Yeah. Do you want to? <laughs> yeah, so we just wanted to start with, um, I suppose, the context of the work we're currently doing, what's, what's most alive right now in the research context here with liquid therapy, um, is this yeah, wonderful building, I suppose, building evaluation capacity within mm -hmm. Drop in the Ocean program. Um, and we're receiving just so much support to carry that research out, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what we're going, what's going to follow next is a snapshot of the we've, you know, with the whole team have developed a, just a way to, I suppose, build in a way of capturing the impact that's also. I suppose meaningful, purposeful, and and user friendly, so it doesn't like add a burden mm -hmm. onto onto the the work of everyone in the program as well. Um, so we're developing a survey that's carried out before and after, um, as well as then capturing some of the more like qualitative aspects that add that richer context. Um, yes. Yeah, and I, I mean that just gives you a snapshot <laughs> of the Adito, Adito yeah. program, which again I'm I'm actually really looking forward to actually seeing mm -hmm. similar things firsthand this weekend. It's the first time I've had a chance to get in the water and and live it and ex experience it. So I'm really looking forward to that. But it's just a snapshot. And to be honest, we've got some text here, but I really encourage you to go and look at the work. You know, go to Liquid Therapy's website and see it does much better than this text can do. But that's sort of a bit of background onto the, onto the program, the kind of young people that Adito works with, um, and yeah. How do we measure this? <laughs> um, this is actually why I got into research, is I wanted to try and understand the things we were seeing on the beach. When I was running the Wave Project, I was just seeing these incredible things on the beach. I was seeing, I always, I always used to tell the anecdote of this young lad who the police said, you can't work with him. There's no, there's no chance. You, you know, he's going to disrupt everything. He's going to ruin everything. It's going to be, yeah, he's dangerous, all this. The young lad I worked with on the beach was none of those things. Um, and he just needed that opportunity to challenge himself, to thrive, to, to be, you know, to be washed clean, to have a fresh start with some volunteers who weren't looking at his past. Um, and yeah, how do you measure that? 
I don't have the definitive, neither of us have the definitive answer to that right now, but um, sort of what we, we're looking at some, some initial elements that we can start to capture these, these changes in. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, um, I'm going to bring you all down now with some stats. <laughs> Eski will bring you back up with some calls to research. Um, but yeah, so just, we're just going to fly through a couple of the quick measures we used. The, the WHO mental well-being scale, the WHO5 as we call it, is a great scale. It's simple, easy to use, easy to analyze. It's actually been designed with the practitioner in mind in terms of you don't need to be uh, a researcher to use this, which is why it's so great. It's also easy to understand for the participants. If we go on to, so that's one we're using to capture well-being. Um, if we go on to the next slide... And this is what we found. Um, you can see there's a change there. Um, this is percentage, so 100% would be your best mental, mental health. Um, zero would obviously be very worrying. But we see we started in sort of just below sort of averages, and we've gone up to a, to a healthier number. Um, just note on all of this, for those of you who are into stats, N is the number of, um, the number of uh, data points we had for this. That's a very small number. Very easy to skew. What we're doing, as we mentioned the titles, we're building evaluation capacity here. The idea is we can gradually bring that number and number up, which makes these findings more, more robust. These are very much initial findings. And to, to stress that point, we had one skew result in there. If we take that skew, um, skew result out, the whole thing becomes statistically significant, even at that small sample size. That's why you need big sample sizes, so you can account for these skew points. That's the only boring data stuff I'm going to do today. Um, R is uh, something called an effect size. Um, that's basically measuring the degree of change. Uh, what we're seeing here is a moderate, a moderate positive effect, which is, is really encouraging in a, in a sort of mental health standpoint when it comes to well-being. If we go on to the next slide. The other scale we've been using is the inclusion of others in self scale, which is a really cool visual scale that I, I really like. And it's about talking about how you... It's, it's about social connections, really. It's about social support and these sorts of things. So... We ask people to rate how they see themselves in relation to another item. Um, so in this case, we've got friends. How close do you feel with your friends? Not very close. So this sort of up here is not very close. Over there, we're very close. The two circles are right in together. The cool thing about this scale is you can change that word. So if we go to the next slide, we also explored this with the C. So we can see how close we're feeling, what kind of a connection we're building with the C. It's, again, it's a really great, relatively simple measure. I love the visual aspect of it, especially when working with young people. Um, and it's a, it's a scale I've used on several projects now that we've had some really interesting findings. Speaking of findings, this is what we found. Um, you can see positive, positive changes to that sort of social support element right across the board. But what was really cool was the, the, the statistically significant, very large effect size we saw in the liquid therapy pods. That's the, the group of young people that are working together. Mm -hmm. And that's just awesome to see. You've got a group of young people and the instructors and the volunteers coming together and really building a close social support unit together. Um, we're going to go on to talk a bit more about the power of that. And, and that sounds like something really quite... Eh, eh, eh. In mental health, those kinds of connections are the foundations of improvement. They are the foundations of recovery. They are foundations of any kind of therapeutic practice. Um, so it was really encouraging to see that. And to see that actually we were also seeing all of the other effects were still moderate positive effects. Seeing that there was that sort of social trust, that social connection, that social... Some people use the term social capital was sort of transferring out of the project into wider life is really exciting. And, yeah, this is the final one we've got, just to explain what this is. This is a kind of qualitative, quantitative thing I do, which is around word association. And we just ask participants to give us three words they associate with spending time in the ocean after attending liquid therapy. Um, this is a word cloud. The bigger the word it is, the more it came up. So lots of the participants said relaxed, happy, fun. That's really cool to see. You know, those are, those are sort of the split session, the gut reaction when we're asking how you feel in the ocean. That's what's coming up. Um, and again, with liquid therapy, happy, fun, surfing. Nervous is there. I think that's good. You know, that's young people pushing themselves. You know, a lot of young people coming to something like liquid therapy will have, whether it's social anxiety or other kinds of anxieties, coming and being able to feel nervous in a safe space and then work on that is incredibly, incredibly powerful. So I actually always like seeing those words in these sorts of exercises. Um, so that's kind of all the, I think that's all the quant stuff. So don't worry, it goes up from here. Um, you've been looking at some of the qualitative findings we had. 
Yeah. So this, I mean, it's just been amazing that the support and, and the participation of, I mean, all, all the surfers in the program getting behind this and the parents and the team, um, because it does take that extra effort. And we didn't want to create a way of evalu- you know, evaluation that was adding an, an extra sort of burden or even stressor or where young people would feel like they're being evaluated. Mm-hmm. We're wanting to actually just understand their experience. Uh, like Maria was saying earlier, it's just another form of how do we listen to better understand young people's experience and um, for them to share the, the meaning and impact in their own words. So I think it's, it's great to have the quantitative and you can get those stats, but they have to be supported, I think, by that wider context and deeper meaning and especially involving then young people, their opportunity to share uh, what that means um, from their perspective. And so that's why then following the, their journey through the program, there's a chance then for them to provide qualitative feedback. And we wanted to offer different ways of expressing this. So yes, you can capture it in the written word, but also you could share photos, do drawings, write a poem, uh, be as creative as you like. And so this is just one example of one of the questions we asked to capture that um, change they feel about themselves and their lives since doing the program. And um, there was a wonderful mix of both the written and the visual. Um, and even here, a lot of them were drawn almost as, as this journey, as a learning journey. So this wonderful image here, of, like starting out on, on the beach and then this progression, like the, the sort of getting closer and closer and that connection with the waves um, forming, like first writing on their belly to get a feel for this whole new world and environment they're being immersed in. And then lots of images sort of towards the end where they're always like standing on your, often standing on top of the wave, that feeling of confidence coming in and being expressed visually. And you really see that captured then and just, this is just one of so many um, powerful quotes. And I love how it's capturing a real mix of that acknowledging and recognizing the change within themselves in terms of their mood and how they feel at being more positive and happier. So that's also reflected in the word clouds Jamie just shared. Um, and then also the, the crew, like feeling that sense of belonging both to place. So what's interesting here too is that learning so much about the sea is, is also part of that, that healing journey, journey as well and that feeling of belonging as well as the social interactions with the crew and the pod. Um, and the ability, I suppose, to the thriving that comes when you're learning and having these new experiences that are also challenging. Um, so next, next slide. Um, yeah, so then, <laughs> this is brilliant. Overall experience. There was a lot of drawings that are quite like this too, which is just brilliant. Uh, really fantastic budding artists. Like, this to me kind of says it all. <laughs> so this was like, this is how I felt <laughs> at the start. Huge wave, that facing your fear, uh, feeling really, you know, the nervousness, but then being supported to meet that in a safe way and just that feeling of empowerment and confidence that comes from that. So you literally feel like you're on top of the world. Um, and this is an amazing depiction of like sort of yeah surfing the the wave uh, of life of the planet, um, and just that wonderful creativity that comes I think from young people with that cosmic connection almost <laughs> oceanic planetary connection. Yeah, next next slide. Yeah, and again, it, we, this is uh, just allowing it then for this deeper reflection. It mirrors a lot of the sort of the quick snapshot we got with the word associations, which is really promising as well from a, a research point of view, but also asking parents and carers to share uh, their perspective on the impact that they saw. Um, and coming out really strongly is, is again, this, this sense of like confidence that um, young people gain through the program. Um, the openness... Um, in terms of communication and coming out of ourselves, our ability then to talk, because the focus is on, say, the the surfing and and not the mental health issue. It's it's on the just being present with the experience and in this highly immersive multi sensory environment. So I think we're going to unpack that a little bit more now. Yeah. Yeah, I think we. So um, when we were looking at this project, and again, it's a very sort of initial. The research thing here is quite. We've just started, and it's it's the foundations for hopefully lots more work we're going to do with liquid therapy but we also wanted to zoom out and look at some of those findings in a more global context in terms of the research we've both done and research that other people have done about this and the theme that really came out with the different kinds of connections that were inherent within the liquid therapy experience um, and we sort of themed them together a bit and the the first one we talked about was safe connections and this is something i'm personally a huge advocate for the need for safe spaces within our communities for 
young people, for everyone. I, I think safe spaces are something that we all take for granted um, until they're gone. Um, you know, whether it's your family, whether it's friends, whether it's when you, I mean, we all saw this, didn't we, when we were suddenly locked in our houses. Um, when you didn't have access to things, suddenly you realised how much you relied on them. And what we mean by safe spaces is a space where, you know, you're, free, you're not going to be judged. You're not going to be, you know, judged for who you are. You're able to be yourself. You're able to talk openly. Um, and it was evident in all the sort of literature, we, well, sorry, all the data we found with liquid therapy, these safe spaces were being held really effectively. And actually, in my research as my PhD, where I work with a number of organisations around the world, holding a physical and emotional safe space was foundational to any form of su successful surf therapy where it is, to the point where I think it is probably the foundation. It's the foundational theoretical mechanism for surf therapy, but to be honest, in my opinion, safe spaces are the foundational therapeutic mechanism for any kind of community mental health um, and clinical mental health. If you can't hold a safe space as a clinical psychiatrist, you're not going to achieve very much. Um, and they train very hard on how to do that. Um, but yeah, we need these spaces in the community as well. Um, so we'll just... So yeah, liquid therapy do this very well. Yeah, so you just wanted to capture visually some ways to think about um, safe spaces and then also then for diverse, the diversity of people who are trying to access the sea and the surf. And I think it's something, you know, until really the growth and advent of something like surf therapy, surfing for many people as an experience and even getting to the beach and in, into the water for your enjoyment or recreation was very, very exclusionary in many ways. And, and it kind of remains so, except for the work of pro programs like this and like the Inclusive Project, looking at best practices to improve greater access to the water for, for everyone. And that needs, of course, in order to create that safe space, uh, needs a lot of support <laughs> and funding. Um, and it's really, really amazing to see the impact that that can have when um, the training and, and supports and equipment are provided to enable the community to offer uh, the yeah offer these safe spaces but also to transform the ocean into a safe space which can otherwise seem really exclusionary um, yes you, okay I'll, I'll speak to the image over here um, I'm standing with a group of women on the beach in uh, in a place called Ramin it's in the southeastern province uh, called of Iran called Baluchistan and this was in uh, this was in 2015, and I've been going there since, well, for the very first time in 2010, since 2013, and I've been involved off and on now for the last decade. Um, but that's where I really learned about the importance of these, of creating, of safe connections and safe spaces. Um, especially the example from this program here is a Be Like Water program we ran for a number of seasons. And essentially there it's recognizing, I suppose, the very different needs based on, on who you are, whether the beach is welcoming or not. So you can't just show up and start a surf lesson on the beach with a group of women who've never been in the sea before in this public space where they're under scrutiny and observation and feeling that sense of immediate judgment. So what we did was actually to go back to that almost a beginner's mindset and strip everything away because it isn't surfing can be the vehicle, but it isn't that it isn't actually always the thing, the focus. And so we actually started out in a swimming pool. Um, we had a closed session that was women only, so we could just show up and be who we were and share our experiences of water and what it meant to us, building that body confidence and connection in, the, in this in a slower way. And then actually then transitioning onto the beach, but taking almost initially the surfboard out of the equation altogether. So the focus wasn't on the performance aspect or having to get something right, but actually was just on connection again, connection with each other, their bodies, the water and the waves, and building that confidence and trust. Um, and it was amazing then to see the, the shift happen there mm. and how even in a context like that, um, it, it's now, you know, fast forward a decade, is a sport that's practiced in Iran by both men and women, not without its challenges um, as any new sport is growing. But yeah, because it, the beach was, we were able to transform it into a welcoming space. Um, and so that was, yeah, that's, that's why I'll leave it yeah. there. And yeah, this, this photo is from Mogadishu in Somalia, a project I work on with uh, a wonderful organization out there called Elm and Peace. Um, and it's a project funded by UNICEF. And a lot of the young people they're working with are ex-child soldiers who were kidnapped by Al-Shabaab. Um, and they've been recovered or, you know, 
um, or they've they've run away. Some of the most ostracized children you will ever meet because El Shabab wants to kill them because they've left El Shabab, and a lot of their communities don't want them back because of the association with El Shabab. It really is just so heartbreaking. Um, but one of the things that I think we of, we often we can get quite good talking about emotional safe spaces, but physical safe spaces are really important as well. Um, you know, the the some of the work I did, I remember some of the quality of data we got is I love hanging out with Elma and Peace because I know I, I know I won't get beaten up. That shouldn't be the base level, like really. And it is very important we remember those physical safe spaces. Sport hasn't done this well over the past 50 years. Um, that's all coming out now. Um, you know, we need to protect. So it is very important when we talk about safe spaces. A lot of people do jump, especially in the mental health sphere, jump straight to the, the physical and emotional safe spaces. Um, but sorry, so the, the, sorry, yeah, the emotional and the, the psychological safe spaces. But that physical safe space needs to be there too. Otherwise, you know, the other bits won't come. Um, but I do think it's so powerful seeing the importance of these safe spaces across different cultures and and how we have to adapt in those different cultures to address the different needs. Um, um, we might find, but the fact that they're still so important is is incredible. Yeah, I know we're, good, we're just kept an eye on keep an eye on time, but <laughs> fear connections. Yeah, so this I mean it's a beautiful outcome I think of uh, um, liquid therapies work and especially Adido and seeing how they really foster those connections uh, among the young people themselves, really creating that sense of of belonging, of being part of something through this shared passion. Next connection, or next slide. Yeah, so th I think the, the images here are really gonna like speak for themselves, but it's almost looking at in, in this moment too, how, how that interaction with water is actually this facilitator for play that le lends itself to this openness, which leads then to that that connection. Um, and just what also what's, what's happening too so often is that it's, it's without judgment. It sort of acts as this, um, as a medium, water itself acts as this kind of leveler almost. Um, yeah, there's yeah. a wonderful example. <laughs> yeah, and th this is a great activity. One of the, pro this is in Sierra Leone and, and the kids are all going in together and basically they will walk in together three steps and they only go further if everyone's happy and comfortable. And it's about building that that you know, social support, recognizing your friends can be really important. Um, and it's actually a, to pull out the discussion I was having with Maria last night around this, the you know, social connections are so important. Um, and we've kind of we're zooming out a bit here, getting global context. I want to zoom out and get like a pan time context. You know, we are social creatures, it's in our evolutionary biology. Um, and in a world where it's seemingly easier to connect electronically, all these sorts of things, people seem to be getting more and more alone. Um, and it's not surprising people are get, getting ill because that is not how we're made to be. It's biological. It's not, you know, and, and this is something that is getting better now, but we still, we still have this dualist understanding of mental health. Mental health's up here and physical health somewhere else. But a lot of this mental health is physical. It's in our biology. It's in our DNA. Um, and we need to understand that and how we adapt that, how we you know, how we, we get back to that. And it's not a case of going backwards. It's about recognizing, you know, what we are as, as physical entities and, and how, we, how we protect that and how we get those communities back in, in you know, where they are seeming to, uh, to sort of degenerate or, or disappear even. Um, yeah, me and mentoring connections, is a, it, so it sounds like it could be very similar, but actually this is about supporting people through, through things and actually it's one step further than just having that positive social support. It's, it's being able to reach out and ask for advice or reach out and get that support and building that within the project. We saw that with the data very clearly. This is the one that went sky high. This is the one that was significant and had a very large effect size. Um, but being, finding people in your life that you can actually reach out to and be open with. And you'll see there is crossover with a lot of these because you can only have a positive mentoring relationship within a safe space. You know, th this, this is, and this is the very nature of of mental health is it is inherently complex and all these bits are intertwined and it does get a bit messy. Um, but what that also means is we have to deliver all of these with excellence. You know, you drop one of them, it can actually mess up all the others. And that's why, you know, uh, uh, this morning we've celebrated the work that liquid therapy's done. You know, we really should celebrate it because it's not easy. This is complex. Mental health by its very nature is complex. So these mentoring connections are so important. If we go to the next slide, what do you want? 
I think. Yeah, I think no, I think you've captured it all beautifully, and yeah, that's just uh, yeah the images. I just love this one. This was from one of my PhD studies. <laughs> just that joy <laughs> from the instructor at you know the individual achieving what they're achieving. Yeah. That's not fake. That's not made up. That's that's real. You know, and that's what makes the Toms, all of your, all the surf therapy mentors who are here today, mm -hmm. um, the guys and girls from the Wave Project, all of you, that that authenticity that you offer in that peer mentoring relationship is so, so powerful. That's why I love this picture. <laughs> yeah, storming connections, <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, I guess this is, again, like looking at why surf therapy as well. I think this is actually something that's really particular to that. Um, and it's, and we saw it in some of the sort of the word clouds and reflections, is the importance of it being so challenging, um, being unfamiliar and unknowing, having to overcome a lot of discomfort from like the cold, navigating these new experiences, and then these, you know, meeting these huge waves for the first time. Um, and then how what happens when you kind of are supported in actually being with that rather than shutting it down and actually able to move through it. And that can be just so transformative and what leads to that sense of um, confidence and the self-efficacy, of course. And in this image, <laughs> uh, it's remarkable. So again, it's a, it's a Ramin in Iran, two yeah, young women. The, the woman at the bottom is Shala Yassini, one of the, the first uh, female, first surfers of Iran, um, who who's pioneered the sport and who I taught to surf in 2013. <laughs> um, and then a, a young woman experiencing the sea then for the first time. Uh, but yeah, it just, their, their, <laughs> their confidence <laughs> in meeting the oncoming wave, I was kind of blown away by it. Um, next, yeah. Yeah, and again, this. So as as Jamie said, it, this is all. The more we get into this, then it's all so interconnected. All of these connections, like one lends itself to the next, and so that feeling of being, um, of having that mentoring support, of feeling safe enough that you can actually then allow your body to relax and sense and feel the water, uh, experience the power of something like the ocean. So this is a mother and daughter here in in Ramin in Iran, doing a. Uh, what we initially do is wave play, and I know it's an aspect too that's uh, integral to Adido of just experience going, returning to that playfulness of just getting tossed around by waves, uh, catching them with your body, feeling that energy of the ocean, and uh, we even did what we called wave hugging at one point, <laughs> learning how to like soften your body and, and have an awareness of your own fluidity rather than tensing up and meeting resistance. So again, how that physical is connected mm -hmm. to the mental always. And when we have these embodied experiences, they really transform our, our inner state and mood as well. And this yeah, is stunning. Your oh, other sorry. image here. Yeah, go back yeah, just a sec. There and then, yeah, this is in Trinidad. And the other thing about those challenges is it creates a really dynamic learning environment. Mm. Um, and what they're actually doing here is uh, this is a project in Trinidad founded by Chris Dennis, who's a former professional surfer. But he's also a fantastic free diver and spear fisherman. In fact, his father was a subsistence spear fisherman. So basically, if he didn't catch fish, he didn't eat. Um, so he's a very good diver. And when you're free diving, you do a lot of stuff around controlling your breath, controlling your heart rate, things that are very useful in terms of emotional regulation when you're facing stress and mental health. And what we found in some of the research we've done with these organizations is the, the water is challenging. The water is scary. Um, you know, the water throws these challenges at you. And if you can teach these skills so here, they're floating and they're learning to control their breathing in a situation that they might not feel entirely comfortable with. And it's something that they then take into the surf. So when you wipe out, we all have a bad wipeout every now and then. The first thing these kids are learning to do is get up, get control of their breathing, get control of their heart rate, don't panic. Um, and what I found in some, I did some research in Liberia in West Africa. And I had some these, these, these incredible quotes from young people. And actually, I'm not doing, a, I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm, I, you can see me so I can actually show you um, about how they told, you know, it was really great because we would do it in the water and they would talk about reacting to a real world stimulus. Their heart rate did spike. They did start to panic. They were worried. And then they were able to do this thing they'd learned on the beach and they felt better. And what that did is it gave them the confidence to take that out into the real world community. And for a little bit of surfer education here, this is a shaka, okay? It's like a surfer's thumbs up. So you take a normal thumbs up, turn on its back, add a little finger, you've got a shaka, okay? 
um, in Liberia, they use the shaka as like a, it's like a communal gre greeting to each other. So if you're in the, the surf club, in the surf therapy club, you know, you're all throwing shakas at each other. And this one lad, I was doing this interview, and he said, yeah, and actually I remember one time I, was, I used the breathing exercise. I was out in the community and I was going to get in this fight. And, I mean, fights, you know, this isn't a schoolyard rough and tumble, you know, in, in rural Liberia, if there's a fight, people sometimes die. You know, there's knives involved, there's, there's guns floating around. Um, he said, I was going to get in a fight. And then I remembered, no, that's not cool. I did my breathing and I went from this to this. And I walked away. And that, that's really powerful. And what's, what's taken the difference there is he could have learned that in a classroom, yes. But actually, he learned it in a dynamic environment where he was able to practice it in a safe, controlled space, but he's able to practice it in response to a real-world stressor, um, which is really, really powerful. And there's a, with the, with the spate of um, you know, awareness around mental health, more and more people are bringing in mental health education and all this stuff. Um, but there are, you can read a mental health curriculum or you can teach positive coping mechanisms, and they are not the same. Um, it's very important we think about how we're delivering these things and how we create these dynamic environments that can safely simulate and enable people to practice these things. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And it really comes out in what young people are sharing from their experience of that dynamic nature of the environment, tapping into the qualities of like the, the elements, the weather, the sand, the yeah, as well as the sea and the waves and, and everything, all the interactions they're having in that kind of more than human world as well. Um, yeah, and the CAM connection. So also, this really speaks to, I think we can go to the next slide as well, and we're running out, we've got just a few minutes left. But that, uh, the lovely quote here of the magic that ha happens in the space between the waves, um, which is one of, yeah, it is what, one of the things I'm most passionate about. Um, so in all of, all of that action and energy of the ocean, it's also teaching that, that stillness and the patience and the waiting, the observation and the listening um, that comes and that it isn't all about the wave riding itself. Um, and there's actually a tremendous amount to, to be gained from that. And it's just wonderful to see that come out in the experiences young people share as well. It's That's as equally as important, that kind of ebb state as well as being in constant doing mode. Yeah, yeah which well, we, it doesn't get valor, uh, honored enough, I think, in our society in general. Yeah, it's yeah, beautiful. And we're back in Somalia. And again, it's exactly that. It's this immersive nature of water. There's something very special about water that does do things. Um, there's actually, not that we're competitive, but blue space does seem to do a little better than even green spaces. It's, that's what the literature says. It's not completely definitive yet, but I'm naturally going <laughs> to... No, but, but there is something very special about it. And in some of the work we've done, again, just talking about that immersive nature, the the enveloping nature of water, it can be very powerful and it really draws your focus. And I mean, we'll do a little exercise here. Um, let's make it interactive, that's good fun. Um, I mean, put your hand up if you surf or if you swim in the sea or if you spend spare time in and around water, fresh or salty, so if you just put your hand up. Okay, take your hands down if this statement is not true. Sometimes when I'm in the water, I leave all my worries on the side. Okay, maybe take, sorry, I've used a double negative there, that's my fault. Anyone, you can take them down now. No, I, I hope it wasn't all my confusion around my wording, but no one really took their hands down there. Everyone who has accessed the water has felt that restorative element to it. They've felt that focus the water can pull from all the noise in here, all the worries we have about things that have happened, things that are coming up. And... A lot of us are, are maybe even unknowingly using that as like a really valuable, I did a, the piece of research, the boy who was jumping up in lime green was with a project in Australia. And um, they're so good at teaching about this because they teach about how it's not about this, just about the surfing. You can find this mindfulness. And for me, this is, this is proper mindfulness. Um, you can get mindfulness doing yoga, you can get mindfulness, but mindfulness is individual. Okay, mindfulness, you need to find the mindfulness that works for you. I cannot sit still and meditate. I just can't do it. Like my mind races, I've worked so hard to try and I just can't do it. It's not, it's not how it works for me. But get me in some water, I can get into that state right away. That's just what works for me. And we need to use things like the, the water, the water here, the water in Mogadishu, and the water in Iran as examples of like 
helping people to access that state, access that restorative, and then encourage them to, to use that in their wider lives because that becomes a, a coping mechanism they can use away from an intervention and a coping mechanism they can use to live healthier lives for the rest of their lives. And that's really powerful. And blue health is finally being taken seriously. Um, not as seriously as we would want, but we're, we're getting there. The fact that we're here on this stage is big progress from 10 years ago even. Yeah. Um, but we need, to, we need to get the word out as well. We need to educate people around this. We need people to engage with it. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting where we're at now, but there's still lots of work to do on that front. Yeah, do you want to speak to kind of, we just have a couple of minutes to kind of wrap up on the what, what next and... Yeah, there, there's yeah. still lots of questions. It, we're, <laughs> we're by no means there. Um, and one of the big ones is kind of what we just alluded to is how do we, well, what kind of a long-term effect? We need to, we're measuring this over the course of an eight-week intervention. What happens after that? And how do we make sure what happens after that's positive? It's something the surf ther therapy sector globally has not done well enough, that research. And we're the researchers, so that's kind of on us a bit as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, looking at how those connections, all of those different connections we've talked about, safe spaces, uh, peer mentoring, the social elements, the, the, the challenging ones, the self-efficacy, the blue connections, how do they impact over longer periods of time? So actually the blue connection is one we know, that if you can interact with it regularly in your life, it does wonders for you. Um, but the big question for me is how do we entrench these things? Like most surf therapy is relatively short term. Um, there are some projects that do it for up to sort of six months and lots of projects have continuation aspects. So ways for participants to keep engaging with the water in a supportive manner. Um, but how do we take these key connections that we've talked about and how do we entrench them so that people can use them for the rest of their lives? Um, and hopefully, you know, work with you know work themselves out of mental health there are always times we need clinicians and as we've said there's always times when we need social support but we need to help people with how they can work on elements as well and how do we get from the short-term intervention to the long-term life change is probably the biggest question hanging over surf therapy right now yeah, no, I really, I really appreciate that. This is, it's been, we could talk for, for hours, <laughs> but we don't have much to say. So I just wanted to maybe leave adding to that as well, Jamie, is just the acknowledgement that, yes, w w what we're talking about here in the context of Blue Health is that we can't be well in a sick sea and really seeing how a huge part of the healing process is also that learning and understanding and connection with the ocean itself, um, which I think is a wonderful kind of, like the secret sauce in the Adido program especially and what a lot of the the young people come away with and that that can be a lasting connection as well but it's also that understanding and listening to the environment that we're in because we're also ecological beings as well as social um, and so you can't separate that either and it's about recognizing those entanglements and not shying away from them and also maybe not getting that's the, I suppose, the wariness I have. We can go down the road of trying to, of measurements and metrics, which are, can be really important tools. But also there are, is so much that we, we can't maybe capture or measure or know. Uh, that's equally as important, if not more so. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to leave it with, leave you with that yeah. thought. <laughs> Eski got me with that in my PhD viva. Because um, I, I come from a very interventionist sort of I was mindset. external examiner. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, but it's a really important point. If we overclinicalize these wonderful natural spaces, they're going to stop being wonderful natural spaces. Um, clinical spaces have, and actually what's really cool is we are seeing clinicians engage with this as well the other way, trying to declinicalize some of their spaces, you know, moving off the couch in talking therapies, getting out from under fluorescent light bulbs. And it is really encouraging hearing clinicians taking people walking outside when they're, you know, you need to manage confidentiality. I'm not saying, like, we're not taking any of that lightly, but it is encouraging seeing the clinicians recognizing that as well. And that, that meeting in the middle is, is so encouraging. Yeah, it's, it's, again, as we said, it's complex and yeah. they're all tangled yeah. together, but if they're tangled the right, right way, it's really beautiful. It is, yeah. For me, that's what Blue Health is. It's like that, in, that total interdependency between ocean health and, and human health, um, the health of our planet and our health. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah.